Hey, happy November. It is November 1st, 2016, and we are going to discuss patient assessment. Patient assessment is in Chapter 9 in your textbook, and so we're going to cover Chapter 9, but you also need to be intimately familiar with the diagram that's located on page 242 in your text. That's in Chapter 7. It's like the second or third page in Chapter 7. Um, and it lists the vital signs at various ages. Those vital signs are super, super important. And if you can memorize that table, it's going to help you out a lot when it comes to patient assessment. Okay, that being said, you will be tested on that table. When it comes time for your test, the table on page 242 is 36 points. Okay, so when we get to your unit two test, which, Chief, do you have your calendar in front of you? Can you tell me when the Unit 2 test is scheduled? Uh, I think it's two. scheduled before Christmas break. The Unit 2 test is on December 15th. Okay, so right before Christmas break is our Unit 2 test. So when we get to that test, that test, that table that I just told you about on page 242 is 36 points of that test. Huge table, huge point value, so make sure you spend the time learning it because it will make a big difference in your grade. Okay. All right, let's talk about patient assessment. Every single time you see a patient, you're going to perform some type of assessment. So in every patient encounter, patient assessment is used to some degree. When we talked earlier about consent, how do you determine whether or not a person can provide consent? Over the age of 18. They have to be over the age of 18? What else? They have to be of sound mind. And how do we make sure that they're of sound mind? Or how do we make sure that they're competent? Uh, not under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Not under the influence of drugs or alcohol? What else? Um, Lack of head injury. Lack of head injury. What's going to happen if they have a head injury? They'll probably be woozy and not thinking clearly. Do you think that recognizing the fact that they're woozy and not thinking clearly, do you think that that's part of patient assessment? Absolutely. Yeah. What about recognizing the fact that they are thinking clearly and that they are okay? Is that part of patient assessment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from the moment you see your patient, from the moment you do your scene size up, you are beginning patient assessment. So every time you see a patient, patient assessment is involved. So it's super, super, super important that you are intimately familiar with patient assessment and you are very, very comfortable with it. Okay? We do essentially two types of assessment. And to simplify things, we break them down into trauma assessment and medical assessment. What do you think the difference between trauma assessment and medical assessment is? Medical assessment would be a situation where you have a, a patient who is sick or ill of, say, a disease or some other kind of a thing, where trauma would be something where you get them involved in an accident where they've physically there's been some kind of insult to the body. Okay, so if we simplify this, our trauma assessment is with injury and our medical assessment is with illness. Okay? This is uber simplified because sometimes you're going to use your trauma assessment for a patient who has a medical complaint, and sometimes you're going to use your medical assessment for a patient who has a trauma complaint. This, so this is super, super, super simplified. We will use our trauma assessment on patients who have an injury, or this is called a mechanism. Something that has caused damage to that patient. Some outside force that has done something to the patient. If I trip and fall, then I, call, I have a, that happens, does, doesn't it? I have a mechanism of injury, right? Now, what happens if I trip and fall because I'm suffering from a heart attack? Am I going to use our medical assessment or am I going to use our trauma assessment? I'm not going to use either because I'm going to be laying down on the ground because I'm the one that tripped and fell because I'm having a heart attack. What are you going to do? Um, 
first. You're going to do trauma first? How are you going to choose which one to do? I'm going to look at the mechanism of injury. You're going to look at the mechanism of injury? If I'm talking to you and I'm awake, do you think that it changes which one of these you're going to use? Yeah, why? They can tell you what's going on, or they can tell you what they think is happening. So I could tell you, I tripped and fell, but I only tripped and fell and hurt my ankle because I was having chest pain. So do you need a trauma assessment at that point in time, or do you need a medical assessment? Medical. You need a medical assessment, even though my ankle is probably hurt. Right? Okay, so when we're dealing with medical, we have, this is called a nature, or nature of illness. So in our assessment, one of the very first things that we do is we do body substance isolation precautions. So we make sure that we take BSI. What's the next thing that we do? Scene safety. Scene safety. Why? Because you don't want to hurt yourself trying to help someone else. Because you don't want to hurt yourself trying to help someone else. Okay? Once we're done with BSI and scene size up, that's what SSU means, by the way, scene size up. If you can say scene size up or you can say scene safety, either way, you're just making sure the scene is safe for you and your patient. Then we deal with our mechanism of injury or our nature of illness. Mui nui. Mechanism of, mechanism of injury or nature of illness. It's at this point in time that we decide which one of these assessments we're going to use, whether we're going to use a trauma assessment or we're going to use a medical assessment. Okay? If our patient is conscious, alert, oriented, and they say, I tripped and I fell, I was climbing out of my motor home, I tripped and I fell and I sprained my ankle. Do you do a trauma assessment? It's a trick question. Yes. Well, I tricked you the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> this is also known as a generalized assessment. Why would we need to do a generalized assessment or a full body assessment? Why would we need to do a full body assessment? If I'm awake and alert and talking to you, do you need a full body assessment? No. I don't know. <laughs> this one is called a focused. Well, it's happened before that I've had a person who falls and say, yeah, my elbow really hurts. And then when you do a full body assessment, you get to their knee and the next thing you know, they go, ow. And it's like, I didn't know that hurt. Yeah, because you have a distracting injury, right? Right. Right. Okay. When we're, at this point in time, when we are choosing which one of our assessments that we want to use, we are going to decide if we want to do a full body assessment or a focused assessment. Can we change our minds later? Yes. Sure. Yes. We can change our minds <laughs> later. Absolutely. We aren't stuck in which of these we want. We can do whatever we, we, whatever we need to do. If we're going down the trail of a focused assessment and you get ready to move your patient and they start complaining of knee pain, guess what? You can switch from this focused assessment on their elbow and move to a generalized or full body assessment. And it's okay. Okay? These are general guidelines. So, a general guideline is for, you're going to use trauma if your patient is unconscious. Regardless of whether they're unconscious because they were injured in trauma or if they had a heart attack, cardiac arrest, and they're out on the floor, okay, they're unconscious. So because they're unconscious, you're going to use a trauma assessment or full body assessment. Or if they're a victim of a multi-system trauma. What does multi-system trauma mean? involving more than one body system. It's involving more than one body system. So they have trauma that has messed with their integumentary system and their skeletal system, or their respiratory system and their cardiovascular system, or their endocrine system and their hematologic system. Okay? The, whatever trauma that they've experienced is affecting more than one, one system. Their nervous system. 
nervous system and respiratory system. That makes them a victim of multi-system trauma. And when they're a victim of multi-system trauma, we're going to choose to use our trauma assessment. Okay? When are we going to choose to use our medical assessment? If they're conscious. If they're conscious, and what else? What has to go along with conscious? Uh, competent. Competent. And how do we determine if they're competent or not? Start asking questions. How do we determine if they're competent or not? If they are alert to themselves, okay. they're alert to time. They are A and O times four. What is that? What are those four things? Person, place, time, and event. Person, place, time, and event. So in order for them to be conscious or, con they could be semi-conscious and not be competent, right? If they're not competent, they're not alert and oriented to person, place, time, and event, it's a safe bet that you should go up here and use your trauma assessment. Because they're probably not giving you the answers that you need to determine what you should focus on in your medical assessment. Make sense? Okay. We use our medical assessment if they are complaining of a focused injury or a single injury. Um, I hurt my knee. If a person fell down the stairs and the only thing that they're complaining about is their knee, which one of these assessments do you think you're going to use? Trauma. We're going to use our trauma assessment. Why? Based on mechanism of injury. Based on mechanism of injury. So mechanism is super, super important. Falling down the stairs, it's likely that they are a victim of a multi-system trauma. And we can't rule that out unless we do that full body assessment. Okay? So, in our patient assessment, we have body substance isolation precautions. We have seen size up or seen safety. We have mechanism of injury, nature of illness. The next thing that we need to think about when we're doing our patient assessment is the number of patients that we have. Why do we need to worry about how many patients we have? A multi-vehicle car accident. And what, what, what particular challenges could a multi-vehicle car accident cause for us? Why do we care how many vehicles were involved or how many people were involved? You need more resources. We might need more resources. Why else? Let's say we go to, we did a mass, a mock mass casualty incident at Dickens, Dickinson Frozen Foods in Pay at once. And we were dispatched to a report of people, several people with difficulty breathing at Dickinson Frozen Foods. When you get dispatched to something like that, what does that mean to you? We're not, dis we're not getting dispatched to one person with difficulty breathing. We're responding to several people with difficulty breathing. What does that mean? Well, it's weird that everybody's suffering from the same problem. It's weird that everyone's suffering from the same problem. Are you going to go in there? I'm not going to go in there. My hazmat team can go in there. Or the firemen can go in there because they've got SCDAs that they can put on to help protect them as they're breathing. Right? I'm not going to go in there because I'm not prepared for that. So when we think about the number of patients, it not, it's not just about overwhelming your system, but it's also about making sure that you are staying safe at the same time. Okay? <clears throat> so if we have a higher number of patients than what we can deal with, or our patients are, the nature of their complaint is such that it could cause harm to us, we need to think about our additional resources. Additional resources. What other additional resources might we need? What? We might need the fire department. What else? Police. Police. More EMS. We're specialized, which is to say um, you might need your, uh, your mass, casualty, uh, mass casualty protocols to be involved. Okay. Uh, we might need our regional response team. 
We might need to initiate mass casualty protocols. What else? What other resources might we need? Mass casualty incident. That's what MCI means. RRT is regional response team. We said mass casualty protocols, so I was wondering why there was some I. <laughs> what other resources might we need here? The sky's the limit, guys. We might need the power company. We might need Union Pacific. We might need Intermountain Gas. Why would we need Union Pacific? How many times did we have an incident on the railroad tracks when we lived in Canyon County? Huh. How many times was Union Pacific out there? Every single time you have an incident on the railroad tracks. It's theirs. Yeah. Yeah. They're responsible. Yeah. So you can look at me like I'm crazy, but Union Pacific was out there every time. What other resources might we need? How about state comp? Yeah, you said that they bring teams together. They bring teams together. State comp does really, really, really well at bringing teams together. We might need poison control. Take this out and answer, please. I don't know who it is, but I'm just going to with this class. Hello? Take a message if it's not. Hello? Um, let's see. Chemtrack. Oh, okay. All right. Wrong um, number. Okay. Hey, look at you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't walk in front of it. You did. Just go right in front of the camera, Mariah. <laughs> Specialists of any nature. Specialists uh, of any chemical, nature. Chemical, chemical engineers. Yep. Engineers. Additional resources. This is literally the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. If you think you might need it, call for it because it's better to have it on the way and cancel them than it is to need it and it not be there. Okay? We might need flight services. We might need ALS. If you've got more than more than enough patients, you may just need a whole hell of a lot of bodies to help carry them. You might just need a whole lot of bodies to carry them. Okay. All right. So when we get done deciding whether or not we need additional resources, the last thing that we consider in the section of patient assessment that is seen size up is stabilization of the spine. For some of our trauma patients, that's going to be a no-brainer. If they're an unconscious trauma patient, you just assume that they need C-spine. Fair enough? Yeah. If they are a medical patient or a focused assessment, do you always assume that they need C-spine? No. No, why not? Because if it's just their foot that's hurt, you don't need to... Their back. If it's just their foot, you don't need to immobilize their back. Good call. Okay. So, these six steps, body substance isolation precautions, scene size up, mechanism of injury, nature of illness, number of patients, additional resources, and C-spine precautions are the six parts of scene size up in patient assessment. Okay. We're going to break patient assessment down into five separate components. And the first component of patient assessment is scene size up. So we do BSI, scene safety, moving new number of patients, additional resources, and stabilization of spine. Yes, I said moving new. You said what? Moving new. Moving new. Mechanism of injury, nature of illness. Moving new. So in the future, when you take a quiz and the quiz says, what are the six parts of scene size up? You are going to say, Mooey Nooey. Mooey Nooey. <laughs> You're going to start with BSI, scene safety, Mooey Nooey, number of patients, additional resources, and C-spine precautions. Okay? Whether you do a trauma assessment or a medical assessment, these six steps are identical. Okay? It doesn't matter what you're going to, doesn't matter what patient you're going to see, these six steps are the same. I tell you that because in every patient encounter, patient assessment is used. This is where it starts. 
So in every patient encounter, you need to be thinking about all of these things when you're doing your scene size up. Okay? All right. Will you pause or will you stop that just for a minute?